Good morning. Happy New Year. If I look cold, I am. <laughs> it's, it was cold here the past couple days. It's actually warmer outside than it is inside. I should actually I should open my doors here to let the warm air in, but um, we're managing. So there are a lot to talk about. I saw a lot of movies over the holidays. I'm not going to talk about all of them here because I'm going to be talking. I would have to talk for an hour, and I'm not that interesting. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll talk about three that are opening here in Hong Kong today and over the next week, I'll hopefully get to the other ones. And I saw some really good things, uh, documentaries, which I don't get a lot to, I don't get to watch a lot of, but I did see this time and some, uh, nice foreign language films. So kicking off today, first film I'm going to talk about, which opens today is called Bad Times at the El Roy L. And uh, it has a, an all-star cast, uh, Jeff Bridges, Cynthia Erivo, who was just in Widows. She was the blonde-haired woman in, in uh, Widows, so she's in this one. Uh, John Hamm from uh, Mad Men, and quite a few few movies that he's been in now. Louis Pullman, who is, I, I, I actually look, looked him up, a young, young actor, but he's Bill Pullman's son. And I thought, makes sense, looks like his dad. Looks like a younger version of his dad. Dakota Johnson from uh, the Fifty Shades series. A uh, young woman by the name of Kaylee Spenny. I don't think she's been in anything, but she's going to be in the new movie called On the Basis of Sex, which is about, um, it's with Felicity Jones. It's about uh, RBG. It's coming out in the next couple of weeks. And, uh, and of course, Thor, Chris Hemsworth, but he doesn't play Thor. But Chris Hemsworth is in this also. So it's got an all-star cast, and it's directed by Drew Goddard, who was... Um, a writer and a producer of many hit TV shows um, about 15 years ago, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, Alias, Lost, um, and he also wrote the screenplay for The Martian, which he won, oh, he didn't win, he was uh, nominated for an Oscar. So this, is, this, this film comes with um, a lot of, I don't want to say hype, a lot of potential. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite deliver because... Um, I would say it's it if we're gonna give it a name, let's call it the Hateful Seven, because it's very much in the style of Quentin Tarantino, similar to the Hateful Eight. And but you know what? It 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 doesn't he doesn't have Tarantino's flair for storytelling or camera work. Um it just doesn't it doesn't even come close, which is a it's a little bit of a shame because I think the movie had potential. But anyhow, let me tell you a little bit about the story. It's set around 1969, somewhere, you know, give or take a year. We don't know exactly, um, but we can tell based on what happened in the story. Uh, these seven strangers come together at a nearly deserted hotel that straddles the California Nevada state line. It's very, you know, a little bit amusing, you know, like half of the room is in one one state and half the room is in the other state. I don't know if that happens. I suppose it does, but uh, yeah. Now, first to arrive is Father Flynn, who's played by Jeff Bridges. And after, you know, very quickly, uh, he's followed in by lounge singer Darlene Sweet, played by Cynthia Revo, and vacuum salesman Laramie Seymour Sullivan, played by John Hamm. And the hotel's sole employee, uh, Miles Miller, who is Lewis Pullman's character, he checks them in. And then, just as that's all happening, the weather starts to turn ugly and icy and sultry. Emily Summerspring, played by Dakota Johnson, arrives and she also checks in. And, and as she's uh, checking in uh, into her room, someone notices that she's, uh, she's also bringing in a woman that she may have kidnapped. And before long, and, and the woman that you may have kidnapped is Kaylee Spaney. And before long, this charismatic, charismatic cult leader named Billy Lee, sort of in the vein of Charles Manson, he arrives to get that woman that Emily is holding. And that's when all hell breaks loose. And if you've seen the trailer, you can get a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about. Now, the movie was released. I'm just going to have a sip of coffee here early in the morning. The movie was released back in October in the States, and at the time, industry pundits were calling this a box office bomb, even though both critics and audiences said it's not a bad film. They were giving it generally positive reviews. 
But I'd say these industry people appear to be right because the film has has failed to earn back its very modest production budget of 32 million US dollars. I think it's like 31 and a half million. So it's just shy of what it's earned, what it what it's spent. And you know, as I've said it a few times, other people said it, a film has to earn at least twice to quote unquote break even because there's all the other marketing costs, et cetera, distribution costs that that uh, aren't in the production budget. So this film really is a box office flop. I you know I think part of the problem was in the states it was it was uh, supposed to go up against uh, supposed to be released the same weekend as Venom and A Star Is Born and the distributor held it back by one week because they knew they were going to get trashed at the box office but even by holding it back one week it still didn't help because they still got trashed at the box office so um, it didn't work now that it's come to Hong Kong it doesn't have uh, very strong competition here for one week because next week we've got Green Book opening and Creed 2, Battle of the Titans. I've seen Green Book, haven't seen Creed 2 yet. I'm seeing it next week, the day before it opens, so I can't even talk about it. But Green 2 I've already reviewed. It's on my website. Loved it. Um, so we'll see. Basically the bottom line here in Hong Kong is if you want to see it on the big screen, you're going to only have about a week to see it because come next week it won't be playing in very many cinemas and probably it will be gone the week after. So it'll be here at most, I would say, two weeks. So uh, if you do want to see it on the big screen, you got to rush out. Now, like The Hateful Eight, this film, Bad Times of the El Royale, fe features plenty of intrigue. Everybody's got a dark secret, and then slowly all these secrets get r revealed, excuse me, through flashbacks, and, and it's all set to this wicked soundtrack. And by wicked, I mean really good. And it, and you can hear some of that soundtrack on the trailer. So, and if, if you've seen the trailer, if, if you haven't figured out, no one is as they seem. That's, that's the bottom line. No one is as they seem. And I would say, you know, this kind of story, you know, just like The Hateful Eight, right? This kind of storytelling, it should be right in the zone for Drew Goddard. This is, you know, when you think about Lost, nobody in Lost was as they seem. You know, this is like right up his bailiwick. But it just didn't do it. It's just like, you know, one thing about Lost, although by the end it just got crazy bad, you know. <laughs> but one thing about Lost is quite often I said, I'm sure other people also said it was, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Um, you know, and it, <laughs> you don't say that here. You know, like whenever there is this reveal, you go, okay. <laughs> You know, whenever you find out that somebody isn't who they are, who they say they are, who they pretend to be, you go, okay. Um, you know, so it just, it didn't work. To me, it was, it was, uh, it was an unmemorable Tarantino knockoff. So disappointing. So my feeling is you don't need to see it in the cinema. You can watch it on an airplane. <laughs> You can watch it at home on your streaming service. I don't think it's, it's not on Netflix yet, but I'm sure it's coming. Um, but if you do watch it um, with a pair of headphones on, turn up the sound because the soundtrack really is that good. So um, that's called Bad Times of the El Royale, you know, like that. So the second film I'm going to talk about is called At Eternity's Gate. This one won three big awards at... I was going to say this year's Venice Film Festival, but it's last year's Venice Film Festival. At the 2018 Venice Film Festival, it won uh, a Best Acting Award for uh, Willem Dafoe, and uh, I think the film won, if Cameron Brough I think the film won an award, and I think the director, uh, Julian Schnabel, won an award as well. So there's a, there was a, there, I don't, I don't think the hype exists anymore, but there was a lot of hype for this film to, um, you know, Oscar buzz. And I think, actually... I think Willem Dafoe's been nominated for a Golden Globe. Look, I actually think he probably will get nominated for an Oscar as well. He is this film. I mean, this film really is him. Um, um, which is not bad, but I, I, you know, that's all. That's all. So this film, if you don't already know, At Eternity's Gate, it's about Vincent, Vincent Van Gogh. I don't want to say Vincent Van Gogh, as most people incorrectly say. We'll say Vincent Van Gogh. So um, this film has actually been playing in Hong Kong for a couple of months, I think at the Broadway Cinematheque, sort of one day a week, two days a week. But now it's 
having a wider release. So that's why I'm going to talk about it now. The film title has been taken from one of Van Gogh's paintings um, called Sorrow, Sorrowing Old Man, and then in brackets, At Eternity's Gate. So that's where the title comes from. And the story recounts the artist's uh, final years when he lived in Arles and auvers sur oise in France. I had to look, I didn't know where, over, I knew Arles was in the south, but auvers sur oise is sort of northeast of Paris, I think. So I'm trying to think, when did he sort of, I think he went to auvers sur oise first and I went down to Arles. I don't know. I sort of maybe I missed that in the movie. I didn't get it. But anyhow, this is the story. So today Van Gogh is universally recognized for his expressive expressive artwork and his bold colors, but when he was alive, he was shunned by Europe's art critics and dealers and collectors who quite simply they didn't get him. You know, they didn't they didn't understand that it was it was so radically different from from everybody else's work. And so he, he was not a successful artist in his day. Uh, it wasn't until after he died where, where people realized his genius. Sort of like me, I think, you know, but anyhow. Yeah. Now, he was often in ill health, and he experienced uh, episodes of psychosis and depression, and many uh, mental health experts today believe that he may have suffered from bipolar disorder, but they didn't know from such things back then. This is the late 1800s, so... You know, it went undiagnosed or untreated and, uh, you know, the rest is uh, left to history. Probably sad. So the artist, he left Paris in 1888, seeking refuge in Arles in the south. And it was there where he completed hundreds of oil paintings and watercolors and drawings, capturing the rural uh, idol that is in, in his now characteristic palette of yellows, blues, and grays, you know, starry, starry nights, paint your palette, blue and gray. Didn't say yellow. But, you know, yellow from the sunflowers and the wheat fields. But his uh, mental health continued to deteriorate, and it, and it led him to cut off his ear. And uh, this is, yeah, left ear. Left ear. Um, and at the age of 37, he died of infection from a gunshot wound that he may or may not have done himself. He may, it may or may not have been self-inflicted. Um, this movie uh, adopts the less popular opinion of how he got shot, um, but it's not the first time that somebody has taken that opinion. Um, you know, so we'll see. Um, anyhow, so the film stars, as I said, Willem Dafoe, who's, uh, he's, he was just, we saw him last two weeks ago in Aquaman, and he's been in many, many films, Murder on the Orient Express, Family Man, John Wick, Faulkner stars in dozens of films over the years, um, and so everybody knows him, and he throws himself headlong into this character in what many people have called his greatest performance to date, which is why I say he'll probably get nominated for an Oscar. And interestingly, he's Defoe, uh, the real, the actor. He's twenty five years older than Van Gogh was when he died. The man is sixty two, and he's playing a thirty seven year old at best, you know, thirty five to thirty seven. But it works because he's every wrinkle on his face seems so appropriate for such a tortured character as Van Gogh. So, so it, he really he you know he inhabits that that person, you know, really fantastic. But as good as Defoe's performance is, the film suffers, in my opinion, from more than a little affectation. But that's not surprising, given the director, Julian Schnappel, who gave us the diving bell and the butterfly. And, you know, he's very artsy and, you know, he's, a, he's an artist himself. So this is why he's tackled this subject. So much of the film seems to have been shot just minutes before Twilight. And it doesn't take long before these these scenes these handheld camera you know shaky camera scenes of the actor running through uh fields you know wheat fields and along dusty roads it wears thin you know it's like enough already and it's very you know quite a lot the film is 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 gray because it's so close to dusk you know it's you know there is the what do they call it? the golden hour, which is, you know, the time that they should film because you get long shadows and nice colors. But he's sort of gone a little bit, half, maybe half hour after that, and it's, and it's dusky, you know. So I, it didn't work for me, you know. And unlike the highly stylized film last year, High, uh, Loving Vincent, 
there isn't much to see of Van Gogh's works here. There's a, there's a couple of sketches. Uh, maybe we see a couple of paintings. He does paint, you know, a few. We do see him painting a, a few paintings, but it's not a lot. And you know what? I get why Schnabel chose to focus on the artist rather than the art. But you know, I think we want to see the art too. I was a little like, I want to see the art, you know. But I guess Schnabel would say, then go see Loving Vincent, you know. So, so you know what? I, 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 I thought this was a good attempt. I thought, but in the end, it was, it was boring. You know, it was really, you know, as good as that performance was, it was boring. You know, like he's got these little artistic touches where half the lands, half the scene, like from here down, he's like put Vaseline on the lens so it's all hazy. And that, you know, that's, that was like, you know, you do it once, but it was like minutes of this. And the score, the piano, it was like this very heady piano score that was so repetitive. So, you know what, I, I thought the film was quite boring. So, you know, I, you know what, I, I'd say great performance by him, but boring direction and, and boring story. Um, so it didn't work for me. It also stars uh, Rupert Friend, who is probably best well known, most best known for TV's Homeland, but he's been in a few other, he was in The Simple Favor a few months back. He was really good at that. Um, he plays his brother Teo, and he's got a small part, but it's good. And we have Oscar Isaac, who's in everything that's normally good. He plays Paul Gauguin. I thought he was miscast. Uh, you know, because he's got, you know, he, he, look, okay, I get it. Nobody had, like, you know, Van Gogh didn't have a Dutch accent, or, you know, like, R Willem Dafoe didn't have a Dutch accent, and Teo didn't have a Dutch accent. You know, they all spoke with, you know, their regular, their regular accents. Um, but... You know, to have Paul Gauguin with an American accent, it didn't work. I, I would have preferred to see a French actor in that role because he had Matthew Almarek in uh, as as you know one of the one of the roles. You know, you have a French actor in one of the roles. How hard is it to find a French actor? So I thought Oscar Isaac that was a miscast there. So didn't work for me. So all in all, you know, I I want I want to like this film more than I did, but unfortunately. It was boring, you know. But if you do go see it, I would say you need to see it because of Willem Dafoe's performance, because it really was a great performance. So that's called At Eternity's Gate. Um, yeah, so sort of so-so. Lastly for today, a South Korean film called um, Swing Kids, which is, um, it has nothing to do with the 1993 film about uh, Hitler Youth starring Christian Bale. That has the same title. No, it's not a remake. Completely different film. Has the same title. And um, a very interesting film. It's this, it's this sort of this very curious mashup of genres, film genres, and decades. And, and it's by popular South Korean director Kang. I have to look up his name because I'm Kang Hyung Chol. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name. But he's, uh, he's made uh, two of uh, that country's most uh, successful uh, movies, you know, at the box office. Uh, one was called Scandal Makers, the other was called Sunny. I, you know, I live so close to South Korea, I don't know my South Korean cinema, so I have no idea who he is. But he was at my screening, and uh, people there were very excited to see him. So, seems like a nice guy. Now, the film is based on the Korean musical called Roki So, who is, uh, that's the name, named after the, uh, the story's central character. And this, it takes place in the uh, Gyoji prison camp in, uh, in, in, uh, on Gyoji Island, which is at the southern tip of Korea. And there really was a Gyoji prison camp. Um, for, and it was, a, it was an American uh, camp for North Korean POWs. That, uh, that we're talking during the Korean War. So North Korean POWs were housed there by the Americans. And the camp's rather unsympathetic commander... Uh, which is a euphemism for a word that I probably shouldn't say on uh, video, but I think you got the idea. He sees trouble brewing because inside inside his barbed wire camp walls, because on one side uh, he had communist sympathizers, uh, you know, Koreans who were pro-communist on one side, and their brothers and their cousins on the other side were were sort of. Uh, 
They were they were anti anti communists or pro Americans, and you know both sides wanted to kill each other. Well, probably the North wanted to, you know the ones from the communists wanted to kill the the uh, the not the anti communists. Um, so uh, so you had them separated by barbed wire. So you know there was the camp was quite tense. So and and to calm tensions in the camp, but most of all to impress the Red Cross observers who were routinely coming there to inspect the camp, he orders Sergeant Jackson, played by Jared Grimes, I think this is his first film, who is a black soldier uh, under, under his command, uh, and he's a former Broadway tap dancer. So he orders Sergeant Jackson to put together a small dance troupe from among the prisoners. Gotta dance, you know, this thing. So after the requisite disastrous auditions, you know, is you know, you know, he's going to hold these auditions, and it's just going to be you know a mess. Um, Jackson manages to find three suitable candidates in uh, Kang Byung Sam, uh, played by actor Oh Jung Se, who is falsely accused of being a communist sympathizer, and he hopes one day he can find his wife and be re re reunited with her. There's Yang Pan Rei, who played by Park Hye Su. <laughs> okay, sorry if I'm mangling these Korean names. She's a local woman who makes a living from dancing with the GIs at their dances, and she speaks enough English to be Jackson's translator. And Xiao Fang, uh, who's played by Kim Min Ho, and he's an overweight Chinese POW who loves dancing, but he can't do it for very long before he passes out. So he's got these three sort of ragtag motley, motley crew to be his, his, uh, his three dancers. But uh, it turns out there's somebody else in the camp who can dance really well. And he's North Korean soldier Ro Ki So, played by K-pop star Do Kyung So, uh, who's also known as D.O. And he sees Jackson dancing and he immediately falls in love with the art form. But his rebellious nature, and you know, he's he's very close to sort of one of these sort of uh, pro-communist leaders in the camp. So he he it, he won't allow himself to get involved with these dan with the dance uh, troupe. But he you, we see him practicing in the slot on the sly, and you know everything he 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 hears the sounds of the camp, and he in his head he's dancing to the sounds of the camp. It's very reminiscent of of uh, Footloose, right? So, so just as this dancing bug really takes hold of him, change comes to the camp with the arrival of his brother, Ro Ki Jin, played by Korean actor Kim Min Jae, and, and who's a North Korean war hero, and along with Kiso's longtime friend, Kwang Kuk, played by David Lee. And Kwang Kuk has been elevated to a leadership position in the pro-communist hierarchy. So you know, so you have these these two things going on. You have these dancers, and then you have these communist agit pro communist agitators arriving. And needless to say, um, you know, change comes, and you know, things happen. So that's all I'll say. Now, as I said, this is a cross between Footloose. It has uh, it features sort of you got a dance off sort of like in the Step Up movies, and of course set against the backdrop of the Korean War, you've got M.A.S.H., so, so it's, a, it's a cross between these three, and, it, and it, it's got a bit of everything. This film's got a bit of everything. You've got, you got a dance-off with a bunch of race-baiting American G.I.s who use the N-word a little bit too often, in my opinion. You know what, I get it. I get it. You know, back then they used the N-word. But I just thought, oh my God, <laughs> you know, it would have been wrong, I suppose, you know, if they if they if they use the politically correct word of today, you know, it would have been wrong. But they just threw the N word out so many times. I was like, yikes! It's a little bit much. So there was that part. Then you have this really an anachronistic soundtrack that includes. Louis Jourdain, Benny Goodman, a Korean version of Hava Nagila, which was quite, I thought was quite amusing. You have the Isley Brothers, the Beatles, and even David Bowie. So you have this, this soundtrack that goes from the 40s to the, to the uh, I'm trying to think, when did that song come out? Uh, I think it was in the, 80, in the 80s, the David Bowie song. Um, so you have the this, this soundtrack that covers almost 40 years. And for the first half of the movie, it's fairly enjoyable. There's a few laugh out loud moments, but in the second half, 
the, another movie sort of takes over. <laughs> another story takes over. And the movie just turns very, very dark. The story turns very dark. And, and this is when these pro-communist people show up. So this movie just changes tone altogether. It just goes like this. And, and you know, you're, you're wondering, well, what happened? I was, I was smiling a minute ago. Now I'm like, you know, okay, I, I, I get that. Because, look, when you even think about MASH, and let's not MASH the TV show, you know, one minute they're laughing, the next minute you're, they're, they're crying. So I get that, but it just didn't work here. It, I don't know. And, and what happens is, you know, I think I think what the problem was, you know, the movie is going on a trajectory like this. It's becoming light, you know, much more fun as they're and you know as the dancing gets better, and then all of a sudden it just you know it starts going like this. It it I don't know. Maybe it needed to go more like that. I don't know. It just 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 didn't work. So and, and what happens is the movie it just really jumps the shark about fifteen minutes. Before the end. Now, this movie, I gotta warn you, is over two hours long. It's a minute, an hour, 133 minutes. So, two hours and 13 minutes, two and a quarter hours long. Way too long. Way, way too long. Needed to be cut, cut, cut. And with about 15 minutes to go, something happens. And, and I was thinking, wow, they've just painted themselves in a corner here that they're not gonna get out of. And that's exactly what happened. They didn't get out of this. They didn't get out of the corner that they that they got themselves into. Was, like the story just went in such a weird direction that there wasn't time to get out of. There was no way, you know, of all the time in the world, there was just no way they were going to get out of this. And I and I thought to myself, you know, it's based on a play, and I'm wondering, does the play do the same thing? I can't imagine that it does because it just doesn't work. You know, when, when they're getting themselves into this corner, it just doesn't work, and which was rather disappointing. So, you know, it, it, to, in the end, I was like, wow, you really screwed it up. So anyhow, the film's going to be released in 23 countries around the Pacific Rim. It's got, it was produced, or it was, uh, yeah, one of the uh, producers was Annapurna Pictures, which does a lot of uh, big releases. So uh, they were involved in this. So the, it's going to get a very wide release in uh, around uh, Asia Pacific uh, and, and uh, North America Pacific, even South America, I don't know, but it's going to Australia and New Zealand as well. So there's a good chance if you live in this part of the world, you are going to have a chance to see it on the big screen. I don't know. You know what? Whether you like this film or not depends on how much you like watching tap dancing and how much you can overlook the rest. To me, this was the problem. The rest was the problem. <laughs> So, you know, and, and it was way too long, way, way too long. But I gotta say, you know what? Um, the kid, what's the, the K-pop star, uh, D.O., you know, I, I don't know about K-pop stars. He was quite good, I thought. He, forget about the dancing. Like, I think the dancing, the dancing was good, although it was heavily edited. So you have to wonder how many, how many cuts did they have to do? How many takes did they have to do to get that right? Um, but he's got a lot of charisma, stains and screen charisma. Um, so maybe this is part of uh, his uh, new uh, profile that he's going to be more in more movies from now on, less less on the stage and more in the movies. So I thought he was good, um, but uh, yeah, it was sort of like that because of where the story went. So all in all, you know what? This is not a great week for releases. <laughs> Got three new films. They're all sort of meh. Uh, so, you know, whether you want to see them or not, up to you. Next week, we've got better films coming. I think that's the issue, is that the, the distributors are just releasing films now to get them out while until these, you know, these Oscar-buzzed films start showing up here. So that's it. I've been talking for a half hour, far too long. Have a great week. Stay warm. Stay dry. And see you next week. <laughs>